Okay, so we're going to continue with the Sefer Iyob, with the book of Iyob. We'll do chapters 13 and 14. What we've seen so far is that Iyob is in a quandary. He doesn't understand what's going on. He has emuna. he believes in God. But he really is doubtful about what's going on because it doesn't make sense to him. He has many, many questions. But at the very least, Iyob is an individual who is prepared to investigate. He wants to analyze, he wants to ask questions. He wants to do whatever he can to try to understand why Hashem is doing this to him. And what we've seen so far is that three of Yov's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sofar, have offered each one in their own style, their own way, different explanations, possibilities. But no one, no one can claim they know with certainty exactly why Hashem does certain things. They all agree, however, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu manages the world, takes care of the world, is a just God. He doesn't just punish anyone for no reason. There's a reason for everything. But they were having a hard time convincing Yov. Yov was making fun of them. He says, what are you trying to tell me? What you said, I know this. You didn't say anything new. I've analyzed, I've looked into my situation, and I disagree with you about sin. I cannot see any sin in myself, in my family. And even though that's being overconfident, as we've explained last time, no one can say he never did anything wrong. And as you will see soon, how the life of an individual has different stages. And even though one can recall that he hasn't done anything wrong recently, but what about during his earlier years when he wasn't paying attention? So you have to be very careful not to be overconfident. As Solomon says, in There's no such a thing as a tzaddik, a good man, a righteous man. He's definitely righteous that he never did anything wrong. We're not angels. But still, Io tells his friends, everything that you try telling me is not convincing enough. And he wants to have a dialogue with Hashem. We're talking about obviously a period in time in the history where certain individuals who were qualified were able to communicate or find out through a prophet somehow, get some sort of answer from Hashem. Otherwise, why would he even propose this? I want to speak to Hashem. I want to ask Him. It doesn't mean that he was for sure going to get an answer or an explanation. Hashem doesn't tell everyone why he does certain things. But somehow, it appears to be that Yov was going to find out somehow. And if you go through the book, you see that towards the end, Hashem does communicate with Yov. All we know so far is that he was a righteous individual. We do know that. Hashem blessed him. He was doing very, very well. And what he's not aware of is that the whole thing that is happening to him, that he's going through the hard times, is a nisayon, is a test. But still, for it to be a test without sin wouldn't make too much sense because he's suffering. He lost everything. So still, it requires a little bit more investigation. So in chapter 13, he begins to say, he continues on to say to his friends, there's not that much difference between you and me in our knowledge. Similar age, similar education, then why do we think differently? Why do people think differently, by the way? Why do people have different opinions? That's also a good question. So the rabbis tell us, In the same way that people look different in their face, people look differently. In the same way, they think differently. They have a different kind of mind. People think differently. They're not all created equal when it comes to their way of thinking. Even though you can divide people into 12 major personalities, the 12 signs of the zodiac, but even that is not sufficient because every two hours there's a different rising sign. That's the sign of the hour that a person is born. So you have 12 times 12, that's 144 times already. 12 times 12. And then you have additional factors in astrology that contribute to influencing an individual. And when I say influence, it means 
his way of thinking, the feelings that he has, his temperament. That's why even though some people are similar, they're not exactly the same. They're born the same month, they're born the same sign. They're not always going to be the same. What explains the differences? The hour, their education, their upbringing, their experiences, and as I explained earlier, what's going to make a big difference in the way people think is their age. Because the way you think today is not necessarily what you thought or what you felt like 20 years ago when you were a lot younger. And that is why the rabbis tell us something very important in Kiavot, in Ethics of Our Fathers. That there's different stages. There's a stage of Bar Mitzvah, there's a stage where one is ready to get married, there's a stage where he goes to work, to earn a living, to provide for his family. And there's an age called 50. Once you reach the stage called 50, 50 years old, you are prepared to give advice to others. Not 40, at 50. Not sooner. Why? What's 50? What's, why is that such a magic number? Because by 50, you have already gone through enough in life that you've seen a lot, hopefully, you've learned from your mistakes, that now you are prepared to give proper advice to others. You may be able to give advice even earlier, but sound advice that's based on experience, 50 and above. There are some people that I wouldn't listen to their advice even at 65. <laughs> Obviously, they're, they're not the best people, but the rabbis are giving us an idea of maturity. Maturity at 50 is a lot more mature than 30, and for sure a lot more than when he was a teenage young man or young woman. So a lot goes into forming an individual, molding his character and his way of thinking. So even though the friends of Yov mean well and what they're saying are not complete lies either, a lot of good points they made, but their explanations are not satisfactory. And that's what Yov begins to say in these chapters. He continues on to talk in these chapters by telling his friends, I want to have a dialogue with Hashem because what you've said doesn't do any good. It didn't calm me down. It didn't say anything to me that I wasn't aware of. And he actually disagrees with some of the things they said. Doesn't fully agree. But at least he's listening. And that's a very valid uh, point to bring out. It's a good point because a lot of people don't listen. <laughs> so he's willing to listen. But as long as you make sense, he says, so he says, I have an argument with Hashem. I want to turn to Him. I want to speak to Him. And he says, your words so far to me were like a witch doctor. It was like someone trying to give a cure to, to someone who's suffering from some illness that will not necessarily help him. Here, just take this because I, I believe that this will help you. What was that cure that they were telling him? Just do Teshuvah. All you got to do is do Teshuvah. And Yov didn't like hearing that. Nothing wrong with doing Teshuvah. Obviously, Teshuvah is always a good thing to do because we don't really know what needs to be corrected. But there's always something to correct, even in our character. Even if we didn't do anything wrong, just to refine our character requires Teshuvah. If we were upset and angry at someone, lazy, stingy, we didn't do anything wrong, but these are characteristics that need correction and refinement. So it is right to tell someone, do Teshuvah, but is that going to take away the problems that he has right now? Or is he stuck with them for the rest of his life? So that was his argument with them, that you really didn't tell me how to come out of my problems, how to get rid of all these troubles. You're not talking to the point. I want to get rid of this. I don't believe I deserve it. So he, he's not 100% right. Nonetheless, he wants to hear something more specific. And the more specific that he's looking for is not necessarily how to get out of it, but what exactly did he do wrong that is so bad to deserve something like that? I've explained it in the past, that when someone 
is having a hard financial time. It could be his mazal. But what would you say to someone who's all of a sudden having a hard financial time, difficult marriage, he has trouble from his neighbors, from his kids, he has all of a sudden some illness, everything at once, you don't have such a bad mazal. For such an experience that everything in his life is going bad all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that must be a decree from Shemaim. And this is what Yob says. Wow, look, so much is happening in my life. Everything is wrong. Everything is bad. Hashem took everything away from you. What could this be? You cannot say that this is mazal. You cannot say that this is a sin. To take away all that blessing, it doesn't make any sense. So now, Yov tells his friends, let me tell you something. You're better off keeping quiet. Atif lachem nishtok, he says. Keep silent. Because so long as you're silent, I still will respect you as chachamim. Wise. Once you begin to say, and I think you're talking nonsense or saying lies, I will lose respect for you. You're better off keeping quiet, he says to them. I guess he was a tough man. <laughs> there's a pasuk actually, there's a verse that says, Gam evil macharish chacham yichashev. Evil. Even someone who is a fool, who is not a good person, evil. If he keeps quiet, you might think of him as intelligent. <clears throat> you might think that this is a smart person before he opens his mouth. Once a person opens up his mouth and he says something, then you can already detect is he smart or not smart? And that's what he always tell me that you're better off not talking. You didn't help me. If anything, you've said things that I disagree with. But let me also warn you, he says, I think that you're trying to flatter Hashem. Hashem doesn't like that. You're afraid of Him, so you're trying to justify that everything that Hashem did is correct. Now, even though you have should not say something like that because we always, that's what we always do. We justify what Hashem does because we know, we already know, we have the Torah, that everything that Hashem does is correct, it's for our good. But as I said last time, it's very possible that Yom, the story of Yom took place before the Torah was given. And before the Torah was given, a lot of knowledge was not known about Hashem. You had individuals like Abraham Avinu who discovered on their own certain things. But even they don't know everything. Moshe Rabbeinu had to ask Hashem, Right? Teach me. Show me your ways. I don't understand why you do certain things. So it doesn't come as a surprise that you would want the same. I need an explanation. What's, what's going on? Once we have the Torah, once we have the Kabbalah, then we know that there's something called Gilgul, reincarnation, we know a lot more. We still don't know everything. And we have to continuously remind ourselves that as human beings, we are limited. We cannot fully comprehend. You know, it's very interesting that there's certain things that we can know about people, even though we don't know them. You don't know them, but you can know certain things about them. How? There's a beautiful verse in Mishle. Kamay mapanim lapanim ken leva adam ladam. You meet someone, and after a few times of speaking to him, getting to know him, you seem to like him or not like him, one of the two. This is an indicator that he feels the same way towards you because there's a mirror image. The heart, the heart of people communicate. If you feel good towards someone, that individual feels good towards you. You can't hide those feelings. Some people attempt to hide, attempt to conceal their plans, their ideas, their feelings, but you can't. In the end, how you truly feel after you know the person, not the first time maybe, but that's the way they feel. So there's something that you can know about a person. A lot of times it's neutral. You don't care, you don't dislike. And the same is true with Hashem. How can we know if Hashem likes us? So the rabbis in the Hasidut and in the Kabbalah tell us the following. You want to know if Hashem likes you? You can judge by how much you like the mitzvot. The more excited you are to do a mitzvah, you should know that is an indicator that Hashem is excited about you too. The excitement 
the love that you have for this is a very strong indicator of how much Hashem likes you. If a person treats the mitzvot as a burden, he doesn't like it, that's not a good sign. The rabbis also add one more indicator. If a person has a bad name, people don't like him, everybody says nasty things about him, that's a sign that wherever there's smoke, there's fire, that there must be something wrong with him. For everyone to like him, that's very difficult, because even Mordechai, a Yehudi, the end of Miglat Esther, it says about him, Ratzul Lerovechav, to the majority of his brethren, he was liked, he was beloved. Not all of them. Yeah, people sometimes complain, are not happy with a person. Aaron Cohen. Yeah, everything. Yeah, it could be Aaron, it could be anyone. Even Moshe, for sure. We don't need anybody more than Moshe. Complained. We complained about him. There are ways that we can tell if Hashem approves of our ways or not, but we will never know everything there is to know. Especially like you were saying before, how does one know what he needs to accomplish, what his tikkun is in this lifetime? Hashem will not speak to him. Hashem does not want to tell us everything clearly because that would interfere with the free will. And I even heard once an explanation that if we were to know exactly what we need to do in this lifetime, we would leave early because we finished our job. We don't want to leave early. Once we're here, we want to have a family. We want to have grandchildren and perhaps Mizrat Hashem great-grandchildren. We want to maximize the time to do more and more mitzvot, to get additional credit. So you don't want to know what you have to do exactly. Let it happen by itself. As long as we cooperate and we do our job right, Hashem will facilitate it that we should accomplish our mission. Hashem wants us to do our job. So He will give us the tools, the talents, the personality, the wife, the right person, hopefully, right? And the environment where we need to be to accomplish. The rabbis tell us something very powerful. They will call you by your name and they will place you where you belong. In other words, you will be put in the place and you will be given the job and you will be given the title of what you need in order to accomplish your goal. There are people, of course, who are interested in money, interested in honor, and they don't end up doing their job. But if we do our best to do Hashem's will, Hashem will help us, for sure. So here with Yov, Yov is trying to analyze his situation. He says, it doesn't make sense that so many things should go wrong in my life. After all, I don't see any terrible sin that should deserve that. So in general, it's okay for him to question, even though we are, you have to be careful not to question Hashem. But in general terms, for somebody like him, who is knowledgeable apparently, it's okay for him to analyze because it's really strange. He had everything good. It's not like he was born in poverty. From day one as a child he was already struggling. He was blessed. And all of that, boom, taken away. He says, how? Why? So what he hears from his friends is not convincing. He says in chapter 13 and in 14, what could it be, what sin could be that should cause all of this? And he describes his flesh, his basar, that the basar nishchat, that the flesh is being destroyed. It's was he was suffering, he was in tremendous pain. He says, what sin could cause my body to feel this pain, this excruciating pain, this terrible illness that uh, plagued him? However, he adds something very powerful. As soon as he says that, he says, however, even if Hashem were to kill me, I would not lose my fear and respect for him. I would still believe him. So that already tells us this is a righteous individual. And that's our tradition. Iyon was a righteous individual. And when you read through the Seth of the book, you see that even though he questions, openly questions, argues, but still he understands that Hashem is the boss. He doesn't lose track of that. He always demonstrates that he believes regardless of what happens. What is he after? He's after one thing at this time, 
Why is Hashem inflicting so much pain? What could it be for? Why does it bother him so much? Why does it bother you so much? You can live, continue to live your life without thinking about this. It bothers him because he's a, an educated person. He's knowledgeable about God. Even though he doesn't know everything about Hashem, he says, this, zelomatim, this is not compatible with God's hanhanga, with God's way of running the world. It doesn't make sense that God should do something. God is perfect. God is just righteous. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. You know, the goyim, the non-Jews in that time, believed in many gods. One reason is because they believed you know, there's a God of love, there's a God of war, there's a God of procreation. There's different powers, they thought. They couldn't imagine that there's one power that controls everything. You mean a good God who's kind and generous and also a punishing God? Even the Jewish people, when they left Egypt, what was their impression? God? Oh, he knows how to punish. Look at all the makot that he gave the Egyptians. One after another, the blood, the frogs. He's a God that gives makot, punishes. Now, for 40 years in the desert, they're learning this same God is so kind. He provides sustenance and food and water and protects you with the cloud cover from the weather. Hot weather in the desert for 40 years. They had air conditioning. <laughs> they had everything they needed. They still complained. They still didn't understand Hashem's ways and they complained. But that's human nature. Sometimes people are ungrateful. Sometimes you give them everything they need and they still complain. Yeah. So Yov is trying to figure it out. And he wants a dialogue with Hashem to explain to him. And how does he call this dialogue with Hashem? I want my day in court with him. I want to have a day in court. And I feel good about it that once I have my day in court, I will win. <laughs> I will come out winning the case because I don't see anything deserving of all this pain. It's a very difficult experience. In the past, not too long ago, they were tzaddikim even, not prophets, even righteous individuals who were so divinely inspired that if you went to them, Rabbi, please help me. Why am I going through this? What did I do wrong? They would be able to tell you. There may still be some like that. It's possible through Kabbalah to know sometimes why something is happening. I'm just going to share with you one quick story as an example. You may have heard of Abhaim Vital, a student of the Ariya Kadosh, who lived in the 1500s. So he was a righteous man, he was Kabbalist, a learned individual. He did everything right, but we all make mistakes. One time he came to his teacher, and his teacher was such a great man that he was able to look at one's forehead, Alametzach, and he was able to see from the forehead which sin, if there was any sin, which sin is it that this man did recently. How? Because according to the Kabbalistic tradition, the entire Aleph bit is on the forehead, the letters. Some of them are illuminated, some of them are upside down, depending if he did a mitzvah or if he did an avira sin. He comes to his teacher and the teacher tells him, I see the gimel is upside down by you. Gimel, what does gimel stand for? Gezel, he must have stolen from someone. Stolen? Has v'shalom, that's really Rabbi, I, I don't steal. Not a thief? How could this be? I'm sorry. Go figure it out. You, after all, Rabbi tells him, you have a business. You never know. Perhaps you didn't pay your employees. I pay my employees? Well, go f figure it out. Investigate. It must be related to your business. So he decides one day, you know, I'm going to call all my employees after work hours. I'm going to put a bowl of money in front of them and say to them, if I owe any of you money, please come and take it. And he did that. Only one lady approached 
and took out a little bit of money. He didn't know why, but he felt happy that she took. Maybe he had to pay her more. When he came back to his rabbi, his teacher, the rabbi says, Baruch Hashem, the sin has been forgiven. Your sin is erased from your forehead. The gimel is back up. You know what it was, he tells him? Now I can tell you what the problem was. This lady who came to you and took a little bit of money extra, it's because she worked overtime. You never paid her for the overtime. You just paid her her salary, but she had a few hours of payment due to her because of the overtime. And since you never paid her for that, it showed up on your forehead. Yeah, we don't sometimes realize that, but we have to be very careful. You owe someone money and pay right away. Otherwise it shows. And you don't want it to show because then it brings all kinds of accusations. All kinds of accusations. For any kinds of sins. But stealing? And here's an individual who didn't even think of that. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher. He's a great man. He didn't even think of that. So there were times when we could find out. We would ask a great rabbi. Today it's a lot more difficult. We can ask. But still the rabbis tell us if you see that you're suffering a lot or something is not going well in your life, it could be because of something that you did wrong. Yefashpesh b'masav, examine your deeds. Should we always examine our deeds? Yes, you should always examine your deeds anyway, even before you go to sleep, examine what you did during the day. On Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment, examine what you did throughout your year. Did you do enough? Did you do not enough? What did you do wrong? What needs to be corrected? Always do an audit on your ma'asim. But especially if something goes wrong or something is not going right, that's the way it should be. Perhaps it could be the mazal, etikun, something to rectify for a previous life, or it could be something wrong that happened recently. Maybe you insulted. You insulted an individual, that's a big, big sin, especially if it was in public. Ooh, very difficult to repair. So, find out. I. Uh, I always like to tell the story of a Persian couple that came to me complaining that somebody cast a spell on them, witchcraft, evil eye, and because of that their parnasada livelihood is suffering. So they came, this is years ago. So I asked them, what's your business? They have a car wash in South Almonte. I said, oh, that's a good business, car wash. Are you open on Shabbat? I said. He says, Rabbi, Shabbat is our best day. Best day? You can't work on Shabbat. <laughs> Rabbi, I can show you the bundle of money that we make on Shabbat. I says, yeah, I know you can show me the bundle of money. What you don't see, however, is that that bundle of money throughout the year will disappear. Your wife may have a root canal. The transmission in your car is going to go kaput. And you may have a big plumbing problem in your house, all that money that you thought you were making from that Shabbat will disappear. There's no blessing for working on Shabbat. The source of blessing of Parnassah is Shabbat. So don't blame and accuse witchcraft. Don't blame and accuse evil eye. That's the first thing they wanted to do because they're used to maybe from Iran. Oh, in Iran there was people who did that. Yes, it's possible sometimes these things happen. But the majority of the time, it's not the evil eye, and it's not the witchcraft, and it's not necessarily mazal either. It could be the person is doing something wrong. And not keeping Shabbat is, of course, a big problem. Because the beracha, the blessing that was there and could continue to be there, will disappear. And you may wonder why Hashem makes it disappear. Obviously, it's a kapara as well. It also is a kapara, it's an atonement for the people that they shouldn't later on have to suffer consequences of that. But the first thing in their mind was witchcraft. Why? Because somebody put a black cat, they told me. Somebody hung a black cat in their business. Oh, it must be a witchcraft. So when I told them Shabbat, they never came back to me. <laughs> okay, we do. Anyway, Yov wants to have this dialogue with Hashem because he's confident that he will be able to win over his friend's arguments whatever they were saying. I had a big problem with this. When I was reading through the chapter, 
I was wondering to myself, how could Yo be so confident? I mean, he was, in everything he said, it showed that he was so confident that he was going to win. His friends are wrong. Hashem will not tolerate their arguments. How could you be so confident? And the reason why I, I had a problem with this is because even great Sadiqim, we learned in the Gemara, were always concerned of Yom Adin. They were concerned when they leave this world. Sadiqim, righteous people, leaders of the Jewish people, their students asked them, why are you concerned? What are you trembling so much on now? You did so much good. He says, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. To Gan Eden, to Gano. Rabbi, you don't know where you're going? Isn't it obvious that you're going to Gan Eden? You're such a high place. No, nothing is obvious. You have no idea. He tells them how strict they are in their courts upstairs. They examine everything that we did. Even that which was done right, did you do with the right kamana, with the right intention? Maybe you did because you wanted to show off. That doesn't count as much. So I'm concerned. So even the tzaddikim are concerned. Iyov, why aren't you concerned? So I had this question about Iyov. How could he be so confident? But obviously Iyov knows himself. And once we get to the end of the book, I'll share with you what he forgot. I didn't see any commentaries talk about this, but it just came to me that there was some incident in his life that he totally forgot. But for that alone, for that incident alone, he deserved to suffer. I'm not saying that that was the only reason. Hashem has other, of course, explanations for it. But we sometimes forget. So the Yov continues on in chapter 13 to say like this, I cannot keep silent. I have to talk to Hashem. I have to get an explanation. I need somebody to convince me because otherwise, if I would keep quiet, I would die from the suffering. So I have to get it out of myself. I have to do something about it. So in order for me to approach Hashem and to try to figure out what's going on, I ask of Hashem two things. And He said that before that he should remove the fear I have because I want to speak openly and that he should take away the pain and suffering so I can fully focus on my argument. That's all he asks of Hashem. I want a fair trial, so I don't want to be afraid. So he continues on to say as follows. Hashem, how many sins does a person have to do in order to deserve what I'm going through? I don't even know why. But for all this pain and suffering, there must be a lots of sins. And I don't even know what. But you know what? I'm not asking about numbers. I want to know about severity. Because I know Hashem, you also look at the severity of the act, not just the numbers. It's not just a number game. You committed 35 sins, and you get this and that. Sometimes one sin, but it's a severe sin, it could be more problematic than 150 sins that are small. So Yom realizes that it could be, it's only one. But if it's one, it must be very severe. How severe could it be to deserve all the suffering? And he continues on to say, Ta'arof aleni daf. You're going after and hurting a leaf that is just flattering away. What is a human being after all? Like a leaf that flatters, insignificant. A human being, in one second you can die. You can stop his heart. He stops breathing. So why go after this human being who's so fragile? Is it possible? He continues on to think. Perhaps Hashem, you are going after this human being because you're also including and considering all the sins of his youth? All oh, the sins of one's youth. They were in trouble. Because Hashem, when we were younger, we were not smart. Now we're smarter. You know what he has just basically said? He said something very powerful. It is true. Hopefully, we're smarter when we get older. But there's also different levels of punishment depending on the age, circumstances, and knowledge of the individual. Hashem is a lot more exacting of a tzaddik. Sir, Rabbi, 
You should have known better. You should have known better. You're knowledgeable. How could you do something like this? This young man, what does he know? He never learned anything. You think they're going to be punished exactly the same way? For the same sin? No. This one knew. This one did not know. This one not only knew, he's also a tzaddik, he's a righteous man, he should have known better. So the answer is yes, the youth from the age of 13 to the age of 20 is treated one way, beyond 20 is treated another way. 20 is like a cutoff time, cutoff line, where sins are a lot more severe after that. It's like the child became mature, 13 of course, he's responsible now, he's an adult technically, but not as much of an adult until he's 20. 20 is when a Jew would go to the army. 20 is already a much more serious stage in a person's life where he's held accountable a lot more than what he did when he was 15 or 16. And obviously before 13, he's like a little child. So there's definitely going to be differences in when the sin was committed. What about if he did it when he was poor? What if he did it when he was rich? What if he did it because he was pressured, because he was tempted? There's a lot of nesibot, a lot of circumstances that people sometimes commit a mistake or do a sin where had they been in different circumstances, it would not have happened. So Hashem evaluates, always evaluates the situation. And no two people get <coughs> the same punishment or the same rectification for the same sin. And the same is true with a mitzvah. Let's say going to the synagogue, one lives right across the street and one lives a mile away. And he walks a mile on Shabbat. He's going to be rewarded a lot more. It's called schar halicha, the reward for walking. More effort. Lefum tzara, a grand rabbi stands up again. According to the effort you invest, you'll be rewarded. He tried harder took a lot more effort, you'll be rewarded. So of course, Hashem considers everything. Everything is taken into consideration. Iov continues on to talk and tells Hashem, you know, I realize I can't run away. <laughs> Even though, by the way, there is a concept in the Gemara called Meshane Makom Meshane Mazal. You may have heard of it. When you change places, you change possibly your Mazal. So sometimes people are advised if they're not doing well in one location, whatever it may be, they're not doing it as well as they potentially could. Perhaps they should change location. Why? Why, why should that have any effect on his mazal? So the commentaries explain because it's not the change of the location that's going to make the difference. Is that when you change home, when you change your living quarters, when you have to move, it's a galut. It's a form of galut. It's like you're going into exile. You're uprooting yourself from one address, one location, going to your That galut mechaperet, that galut, that exile, atones. Look at what's going on in Ukraine <clears throat> or in other countries in the world where people are being exiled for whatever reason, for different reasons having to leave their country, they would rather have not, they would rather have stayed in their country. But because of the economy, or because of war, because of pressures, they need to leave. You think it's easy? It's not easy. In the olden days, it was even a lot harder. Today we have airplanes. Some people risk their lives by boat every single day from North Africa to go to Europe. So that sometimes is necessary if a person needs a kaparan atonement. So running away from one's suffering will not always help because of what the Baal Shem Tov says. The Baal Shem Tov used to say, one who's going through suffering is like a pregnant woman. You think if the pregnant woman moves to another city, she won't take the pregnancy with her? She just moved somewhere else, so what? Wherever she will go, she takes her pregnancy, her fetus with her. If it's meant to be, destined that the person should suffer wherever he travels the suffering and pain will go with him unless of course he does teshuvah, he does something some tikkunim that can alleviate the situation but just moving will not necessarily 
help the individual. So that's what Yosef says. Where can I go? What can I do to get rid of all this pain? In the meantime, he says, all this pain, what it's doing to me, it's causing my body to fall apart, to rot. Why does he say that? It's obvious, because illness to the physical body is a lot more difficult than financial difficulties. If Hashem touches a person's finances, which is usually first, before he touches the physical body, it's a lot easier to handle. Money comes, money goes. It's like people who lost their homes in a tornado, in a, in a hurricane. They can rebuild. Hopefully they'll get help to rebuild. But if someone's life is lost, or if he becomes maimed, crippled, paralyzed, that's terrible. So the physical body, pain into the physical body is a lot harsher than financial losses. And that's why he says, Hashem, look, this is debilitating. Look what it's doing to my, to my body. But sometimes, the reason Hashem will do that, He sent pain and suffering to the physical body, is because even the physical body is just a shell. The real essence of the human being is the neshama, is the soul. And now Tisha B'Av is coming. What good thing happened to Tisha B'Av? You know? Good thing. The temple was destroyed. Yeah, but Hashem yishlich et chamato al avanim, velo alem. Hashem cast his anger on the stones and not on us. It was by destroying the, the temple, a lot of the Jewish people survived. Imagine, God forbid, if you would have gone after the people, like, like the Holocaust, unfortunately, six million, a third of the Jewish people perished in the Holocaust. During the time of the Bet HaMikdash, the building was destroyed. So same thing with the body, the physical body, Hashem says, I would rather take care of your problems, of your sins, by going after the physical body, if going after your money was not enough of a lesson. Because that will serve as a very powerful atonement, instead of your neshama later on, your soul have to, having to suffer the consequences. The only difficulty with a physical body suffering is that it's hard for it to function. If a person is debilitated, weak, it's hard for him to perform its mood. But it's always better, the rabbis tell us, to suffer down here than in the afterlife. So if one sees that he tried everything, the doctors couldn't help him, he prays and prays and prays, at the very least he knows that he paid for it down here and not above. That was chapter 13. In chapter 14, just briefly, Yov continues on his dialogue, and he says, man is really at a disadvantage. When you loot Isha, he says, he's born to a woman, in other words, to another human being. He comes from an unclean place, impure. We're not angels. He lives only a few years. He therefore suffers much more than he enjoys life. He's such a disadvantage, Hashem. Why? Why make him go through this? There's not too much left to do in this world if it's only going to be so short. Why make him suffer too? But what do the rabbis tell us? We know something that Iyo perhaps wasn't aware of, not focus on that. Aulama zeis prosdor. This is just a temporary life. It's not the only life. Some people think you only live once, enjoy, eat. No, it's not true. This is a prosdor. All it is is a short corridor. Some people, 60, 70 years, 85 years, okay, but it's still a corridor, it's still temporary. But Yob says, no, I can't understand that if man is so low, why would Hashem be so involved in his life? You know, even animals have it a lot easier. An animal doesn't have to worry about getting a suit <laughs> and dressing up and taking care of himself. Why should it be that the human being who is the crown of creation, that Hashem should go after him so much? He goes after the human being much more than anything else. And he's so shafel, he's so low, a low creature. He doesn't last that long. And he goes on in his words to say, is it possible for something that comes from Tum'ah, from impurity, to become Tahor? In other words, is it, some, is it possible for something that has so many disadvantages, the odds are against him? that he should ever become a good person, 
become pure? Yes, some people become pure, but the average, Hashem, then why go after him? He's already from birth full of chisronot, full of disadvantages. What are the chances that he will be a good person? So this is what's going through Iyom's mind. This is part of his dialogue with Hashem. Why do you go after him? And he goes on and says as follows, it appears to be, this is what he says, it appears to be that his life is already predestined anyway. Hashem, you already made the decision from before. And therefore, it's difficult for us to change. We don't have that much free will. That's what Iyov thinks, and he's wrong. He's not completely right about that, because we still have a certain degree of free will. But some things have, pre, some things have been predetermined, predestined. But according to Iyov, the way he sees it, man is not so hofshi, he's not so free to do what he would want to be, to do what he would like to do. So how could you bring upon him a din v'cheshbon? When you've already almost, almost decided everything for him. Therefore, Iyov wants to finish his presentation. It's only correct that you should remove from him all the suffering and all the pain. He should not have it so difficult in life. Or don't predetermine it from beforehand. Leave it to him completely, for him to choose if he wants to be a, a righteous man or not. But complete free will. Anything that he wants. No predetermination. Because Eov continues on to say, towards the end of chapter 14, a etz, a tree, has a better chance of recovery than a human being. You cut a branch, you even cut part of the tree. It dried up. It could still be restored. It could be replanted. A new branch will grow. Man becomes weak. Man becomes incapacitated or worse. He dies. That's it. That's the end of him. The moment I saw that pasuk and other pasukim as well, I can tell, as some of the commenters wanted to say, that he didn't relate to something called chiyat ametim, yo, that the dead will rise. Because he's looking at it as many people have, who have this way of thinking of philosophy, that this is the only life. So therefore, he says, man is gone, and that's it. And he's having a hard time figuring this out. Why should the human being be so unique that Hashem is after him so much. And then he asks for something very strange. Hashem, you know what? I would rather die temporarily. Even take me away, but just temporarily. And then bring me back. In other words, get me away from this situation. And then bring me back if that's possible. It's like he's wishing for himself. Do anything for me to take me away from the present situation. So I can go back to what I had before. And he says, man is like a mountain that collapses, like stones that are being washed away and being chipped away through the waters, deformed. You know, it's so much goes through a person's life that he's like stones or like a mountain that collapses, like that falls apart. When is this noticeable? Especially le'et zikna, he says, towards the end of a person's life when he becomes old, it's noticeable that older person is not the same young man who was in his 20s, active, doing things. He's already, you know, slowing down. That's when you notice that this man does not have the same hope. What does he look, have to look forward to? He has no way of knowing what will be with his children. He's about to let go of them even though he may have spent time with them, he may have invested in them, are they going to look after him? That's another point. If you read between the lines, you can see that a yog is saying, what's the hope that a man in his later years should have? What is there for him to look forward to? Is he going to be respected? Is there going to be anything that people will do for him and help him out after he leaves this world? Maybe nothing. Therefore, what he really should be concerned with, and what should really bother him, is he himself. What will be with himself? There's no reason for him to even start worrying about everybody else, because all of that will be forgotten. And this is sad. A person leaves this world, he dies. After a certain amount of weeks or months, people forget about him. 
So Iov is saying, see, what is there of this man afterwards? What should, does he have to look forward to? And the bottom line, and that's how chapter 14 pretty much ends, even though he doesn't say it in his words, but I would like to just add that Iov is right. Man's priorities perhaps and concerns change towards the end of his life, not knowing what lies ahead. Therefore, he should not depend or trust anyone to do for him after he leaves this world. That they will pray for his soul, for his neshama, that they will do tzedakah. Don't leave it in the hands of the kids or anybody, because you cannot guarantee that they will follow them. You do whatever you can while you're alive. Whatever you can, put away whatever you can, money for tzedakah, that you have control over with. Don't depend on others. If you give instructions, who says they will follow? While you're healthy, while you're alive, take care of yourself. That Bezat Hashem, all of the sechuyot that you've accumulated while you're alive, all those merits, should be there in the afterlife for you, Bezat Hashem.